Greetings, my name is Christy Baer and I'm the Assistant Director of the Center on Finance Law and Policy. I am thrilled to welcome you back to our monthly Blue Bag Lunch Talk. Um, today, our speaker is Peter Adrians and before I tell you about him, you know that I am not happy until I have a chance to plug other Center on Finance Law and Policy activities. And so next Monday, I want to let you know that we are sponsoring a panel that's part of UM Africa Week. Um, it's called FinTech in an African Context. And we have some very cool, found, the founder of Migo Money, um, the founder of M-Pesa, the founder of, I mean, sorry, and the former governor of the Central Bank of um, Nigeria, all on the panel. Um, so anyway, it should be pretty good. I hope you'll come. The If you click on that link, then that's where you will register. So please join us for that. But today, we're here to talk about environmental finance. Let me tell you about Peter Adrians. Um, Peter is the person at the university that you reach out to when you want to make something happen. And so if you look back through his uh, bio, he has uh, found he is one of the co-founders of the university's fintech collaboratory. He's the founding director of the Center for Smart Infrastructure Finance. He has appointments at Ross Engineering. Uh, sees like he knows everybody. This is the guy that you want to know. His research focuses on data-driven digital business and finance models, and specifically he looks at blockchain applications, smart cities, infrastructure, and how to um, use technology to um, advance public, um, public financing for the greater good. So, um, this term, he's teaching an entrepreneurial business fundamentals class and a class on infrastructure finance. And I also have to plug for a minute the new Masters of Engineering in uh, Infrastructure Finance. So if you understood half of the things that I just talked about, you're in for a treat. And if you don't, then that's okay too, because the other thing that I like about Peter is that um, he can explain complicated things in a straightforward way, which is the hallmark of a good teacher. So um, without further delay, um, Professor Adrians, I'll leave it to you. Well, thank you very much, Christy. Great introduction and uh, great to see everyone here on, online. Uh, of course, it takes about 30 years to uh, get to know everyone on campus. So I mean, I've been around long enough uh, to find the people in, uh, in engineering and in the the business school sees and the school for public policy, right? I mean, as Christy mentioned, uh, uh, I'm co-founder together with uh, the Center of Finance, Law and Policy, uh, Michael Christie and, and, and uh, Adrian Harris uh, at the public policy, as well as um, our colleagues at the business school, the FinTech initiative in this whole new collaboratory. But that's actually not what I'm gonna be talking about today. <laughs> so I, I do have a, uh, um, a course that I'm teaching in fall also on environmental finance. And so this whole you know, kind of integration between environmental finance and as we'll see in a little bit, infrastructure and data and how things are moving forward in the current um, uh, day and age, I guess, of you know, new sustainability scrutiny in the financial markets is becoming very relevant to the topic of today. Uh, I should mention uh, most of the, the the topical areas. It's going to be a, a bit of a, a finance talk, though. I promise no equations. I'm going to have some some charts, but uh, we're, we're going to keep the modeling out of it. Um, but uh, the, the the two of the topics that I'm going to be referring to uh, relate to a collaboration that we currently have with Nuveen. Nuveen is uh, the investment arm of TIAA. TIAA, of course, is the teacher's pension fund of which the University of Michigan is the largest client. And so they're also a major driver in, in the sustainability space, actually since 1989, uh, before the modern definition of what sustainability was. So they've been in the business for a long time. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking a bit about some of the work that we're doing in uh, uh, one of my, uh, it, one of our startups, Equarius Risk Analytics, related to this environmental or to the sustainability scrutiny. So first off, what is sustainability scrutiny? Let me see if I can, um, can everybody see this yet or not yet? Hang on a second. So let me go into, Yep. 
is this forwarding for you or not? Yes, we're good. All right. Yes. Um, so let, let's start with a couple of recent headlines and I'm trying to manage my uh, gallery here. Uh, recent headlines that uh, many of you may have seen, may have read. Um, uh, most recently, I mean, the US was a little bit later to the game as, as uh, relative to, uh, to Europe, but uh, the Fed Chair Powell says central banks must help address climate change uh, because of implications on monetary policy, uh, bank regulation, financial stability, um, in sustainable business and finance just, just a couple of days ago. A big statement coming up. Investors are finally waking up to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. But sort of question is, how do we quantify risk? How do you quantify risk from ESGs? Uh, big elephant in the room. And then three, uh, out of environmental finance, which is a blog I use very often, not only in my classes, but also in my research, that actually investors are starting to use, and financiers are starting to use ESG data, environmental, social, and governance data, as almost a canary in the coal mine for credit rating. So for you know your your uh, uh, Standard and Poor's or Moody's uh, credit rating. So so the sort of this this connection that's being talked about between climate and sustainability and financial stability and financial regulation and whatnot. And it's still a very confusing at this point a very confusing topic because financial materiality is not very often sort of linked into this whole sustainability discussion. A lot of it is still about we got to do better, we got to develop sustainable practices, uh, it, it, it's good for long-term growth, it's good for your stability and whatnot. What I wanted to do is a little bit more scrutiny and go a little bit deeper on how all this sustainability links into sustainability conversations, link into materiality, link into um, issues uh, around not just climate change, but sustainability more broadly. Um, so, and, and let me start out with the Financial Stability Board. Um, not too many of you may be familiar with the Financial Stability Board. Financial Stability Board was essentially uh, put together uh, in, uh, in 2009, after the last financial crisis by the G20 at the Pittsburgh meeting at that time. And, the, and so basically the whole idea was, well, let's set up a, a board and figure out, I guess, how we can standardize, not yet climate, but in general, other risk disclosures that are currently not being disclosed by either corporates or other players in the market. By 2005, the, the, the Financial Stability Board uh, launched a task force on climate-related financial disclosures. Because as you see here on the left, the argument is that climate-related risks are a source of financial risk, and it's being talked about, as you just saw in the headlines, over and over again. And, it, it, and the argument is, if it is a source of financial risk and a, and a source of market risk, it falls squarely within the mandates of central banks, of supervisors, to ensure that the financial system is resilient to these risks. Now, the big question is, that might be true as a statement. The big question is, how do you actually then quantify that, or how much of an impact does climate change and all these ESG and sustainability disclosures that, that corporations as well as public governments uh, are, are uh, issuing, how well are they related to financial risk and how do we quantify that? How do we look at sort of the perturbations of these financial risk in the market? On the right, I'm, I, I mentioned that, uh, you know, I mean, climate related risk is non-diversifiable. So it's not easy for a corporation, global corporations that are currently operating uh, in a market to diversify away from climate risk because one way or another, whether it's through water, whether it's through temperature, whether it's through uh, uh, droughts or storms or whatever, you are exposed and therefore there is a financial impact. Now, there, just to be sure, there are currently no mandatory disclosures. So even the, the task force of climate related disclosures is not a mandatory disclosure. It is a, it is a, a suggested disclosure on how uh, how corporations should keep track of how their operations and performance are being impacted by climate change. And so we're looking at issues such as revenues uh, by the, of the company, I mean, how stable are those, expenditures, assets and liabilities. And of course, in assets and liabilities, in the context of carbon, we talk a lot about stranded assets. Right? It's a lot, a lot about uh, um, facilities of corporations that cannot um, maintain or continue uh, productivity under uh, current either 
carbon guidance, but also cannot maintain productivity as a result of, of, of water impacts as a result of climate. I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. And then, of course, there is the whole question regarding, you know, is climate impacting, you know, how, uh, how corporations as well as, as banks actually finance, um, or, uh, finance new projects and new programs. So, so there is a guidance structure here, and this kind of gives you a sort of very high level 30,000 foot overview Right, so we're basically we're looking at on the one hand all the risks, I guess, that corporations, and I'm going to be extending it also to local governments uh, later on in my talk, but are impacted by policy and legal technology, uh, technology deployment or or, or technology non-deployment, uh, market risks, right? Market risks, uh, the, the whole perception around climate change and how that's impacting customer base, and then of course the whole, uh, I mean, reputational and and, and other risks. On the other hand, we have the uh, the new uh, opportunities, right? The opportunities of resource efficiency. A lot of talk about resource efficiency. I'm going to talk a, a little bit about resource water usage and consumption, but also energy sources that are being procured. Uh, most recently, even though it didn't help them, right? The Keystone Pipeline. Some of you heard about that. That of course it was allowed under to proceed under uh, the Trump administration as soon as Biden came in office on day one. He killed off the Keystone pipeline. Keystone responded right away and said, wait, wait, we're going to be pumping all our oil through this pipeline using renewable energy. Well, it wasn't enough to, to actually make a difference. I mean, the project is still not, not moving forward. But so the use of, of, of you know, how, how new energy sources are being used in corporations and in projects are all sort of new opportunities for corporations to actually respond to the risks on the left, right? But of course, all of these a financial impact from an income perspective, from a cash flow perspective, uh, and from a balance sheet perspective. And that in turn has an impact on the capital markets and on how one discloses one's, one's risks. Uh, so the, what I'm gonna be probing here a little bit is, well, we don't really have um, standardized or benchmarked ways to disclose this information. And if there is no benchmark or no standard, neither the Securities and Exchange Commission nor any other uh, organization is going to mandate that corporations uh, are going to be disclosing these kind of risks because, as I said, there is really no common standard at this point. So we're still very much in the exploratory stage. The good thing is that information is starting to pop up, right? And so, so let's talk, with, talk about ESG because whereas some of you May have heard about TC, uh, TCFD, I don't know, TC, TCDF, I guess I got uh, dyslexic here for a little bit. So <laughs> Task Force on Climate Related Disclosures actually has a relationship to ESG. And, and many more of you may be familiar with ESG, which is an, an equally confusing concept. Uh, but it's sort of all the aspirations, I guess, that, that, that corporations and different aspirations by, by industry sectors have on how they will either disclose the risks or manage the risks. But again, there is no benchmark. I mean, you look at them I in mean, Thomson Reuters, you look at MSCI, you look at Sustainalytics, you look at all these different you know, ratings providers, and they're all going to look at ESG ratings, which are in many ways tied to, you know, to, to, to climate and to social and to risk management and to governance of the operation. It's not, again, not standardized, right? So if, if neither TCDF is required or standardized, nor ESG being standardized or required, then how on earth are we going to bring the two of them together and say we have to disclose our our material risks? Well, what is the what is then the baseline, right? I mean, both of them are related, but both are equally poorly specified. I mean, despite the fact that now we have a, a sustainable um, um, hello. The standards board in, in, in California that's trying to standardize how we disclose ESG risks. And, and despite the guidance that comes from the Financial Stability Board through the TCFD on how we disclose metrics and targets, uh, risk management strategies, strategy and governance. The big question is, are these ratings, even if they're connected, these ratings that might relate to your TCFD, a good measure of material risk or returns? Right, so that's ultimately what we want to probe. Right, it's that 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 scrutiny in the markets has to at some point boil down not to 
what we call metrics creep. Um, you know, again, talking about this here ESG ratings, you see, I mean, a lot uh, pizza that sliced up in many different ways. So we have ratings providers that come up with more and more metrics. The question is, are they materially relevant? And if they're not, then we're running into problems in how we're going to be disclosing information that we need to disclose. So what's this financial scrutiny that I'm talking about here? Two things, and two things that are very related, right? So one, do risk disclosures condition capital for sustainable investment? Uh, and conditioning capital for sustainable investment really means is capital that gets used to invest in companies and projects in different sectors, whether it's agriculture or mining or whatever it might be, does, does that take into account these ESG or sustainability risk disclosures? Or do these sustainability risk disclosures provide a financial incentive for corporate sustainability? Corporations disclose a lot too, but how material is it to the company? So how material is it to investment, to the investment side, and how material is it to, to, to the corporation? So I want to sort of go beyond saying we need to disclose everything uh, to saying, well, it's important that we understand what the materiality is, what the impact is of these of these uh, disclosures. So connecting the two dots, the, the capital side and the corporate side. And for those that I didn't put the link in here, but this sort of evolved out of a conversation that uh, I uh, I had uh, for, for a long time with John Allen at the School of Environment Sustainability Ravi Anapindi at the, at the Ross School of Business, um, and, and that we uh, essentially uh, um, structured as a talk uh, for uh, Earth Day at 50 uh, last March, so almost a year ago, with a talk about conditioning, sustainable conditioning of capital, and uh, the talk is actually available online. So well, let's talk a little bit about this, and we're going to start sort of at a, at a top level here, right? So does ESG scoring have financial materiality? And the indicators, and these are indicators, this, this is 2016 through 2019. These are not my data. This is from uh, MSCI. MSCI is, a, uh, is a, um, an, an index provider, uh, but MSCI uh, spun out of, of Morgan Stanley. That's what the MS stands for. It spun out I mean, almost 20 years, more than 20 years ago. And they look at risk, right? But they also have a group called the, uh, the, the ESG Research Group within MSCI. So they set up sustainable indexing. And they've been looking at sort of sustainability for a very long time, for about 20 years, in from a financial side. So not from an environmental disclosure side, not from a total tons of carbon or total acre feet or square or, or cubic kilometers of water or from biodiversity, but really looking at this through a financial lens, right? And what we see here are sort of three pieces of information on cost of, cost of capital. And as this, this is the, the, the cost at which, the, the cost to a corporation to get um, debt, I guess, acquire debt from banks uh, uh, or, um, uh, or, or to uh, sell their shares in the market and get the returns from that. And what it lists here, what it compares here, are companies that have a low ESG rating and companies that have a high ESG rating, and then you got the other quartiles in between, right? So this is the bottom, uh, actually bottom quintile, right? The top quintile, and you got the other ones in between here, right? And this is for the USA, for Europe, Japan. So total cost of capital, cost of equity, uh, and cost of debt. So, so the debt is probably the easier, the easiest to understand for most of the audience. That is, if a corporation wants to expand, right, build a new facility, expand its operations and whatnot, and it goes to the debt markets to actually get a loan, the, 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 the debt market to whomever the, the bank is, the investment bank is, looks at the corporation, looks at where they're going to be putting that, that facility, but also looks at how that company manages, it, manages uh, its risk. And what we're seeing, for example, just here on the right, right between dark blue and orange, that there is a significant impact of whether a company is, is, I guess, completely transparent in disclosing its ESG risks or not disclosing or very poor, if, poor or not disclosing its ESG, ESG risks, i.e. the cost of debt is lower for a higher ESG rated company, for a lower ESG rated company. As I said, these are data from 
uh, that were uh, currently available 2016 through 2019. We're going to keep 2020 <laughs> for now out of any kind of financial analysis because uh, as we have learned, I mean, it's going to be quite an anomaly in every, every, uh, uh, every forth forthcoming analysis. So, and, and the reason for that is that that high ESG rating rated companies, I mean, companies that disclose and understand a lot of their factors that they are exposed to, that expose their, their future growth, their future revenue, uh, their future operational capacity of facilities, their future uh, um, um, maintenance of their assets and whatnot, actually have more resiliency, the more resiliency to, to future, I mean, climate and social and other types of um, um, impacts on their operations, right? So higher ESG rated companies tend to be less exposed to systematic risks than low ESG rated companies. This isn't just climate. This is right now just, this is ESG and ESG has E, S and G in it. So E, the climate technically would fit in E, right? Under the environmental. Uh, however, climate means more than carbon. We very often tend to take a very reductionist approach and look at climate as being carbon. Climate is much more than carbon because it looks also about where you operate, how you operate, how you engage with the community, where you operate, et cetera, et cetera. But what we're seeing is that these high ESG rated companies are less exposed and therefore they're rewarded by the market in actually having to pay less for their debt, right? So that's a great sort of initial step. So there is actually some materiality in disclosing that information to the market. So, so let's look at, let's drill this down because ESG is sort of everything but the kitchen sink as you just saw before, right? It is all the factors. I mean, you got the three pillars, you got the E, the S and the G and under, you know, under E, under S and under G, you got multiple different factors that are measured in many different ways. So, so there is sort of a lot of uncertainty in looking at that bucket, bucket of data. So let's look at one specific one, for example, just water risk. And frankly, I mean, I, I'm very involved in water risk and when I go to climate conference or investor conferences, many investors now will look at climate through a water risk lens. Because they say water risk is local. You can say a corporation has a certain exposure, a carbon exposure, but its water exposure is very local based on is the facility in the US exposed, the facility in the Northeast, the South, South, uh, the Southwest. Uh, in Central America, Europe, South Africa, where are its operations, right? And sort of going to these very specific localities gives you, and then looking at the weather impacts and the climate impacts, both of them in these regions sort of gives you a reading uh, on potentially where the water risk exposures are. And here's some data. So CDP, uh, which is a, a nonprofit out of, uh, in, in London, actually they're also in New York. Uh, CDP stands for Carbon Disclosure Project. It started as, as a carbon disclosure project, but they have actually a water disclosure group within CDP. Uh, so they look at the, the water report. And so some, some ideas here, 75% of largest reporting companies identify high, higher water risks year and year. And high water risk is bo both a risk from the perspective of how much you use, the quality that you use, the access that you have to it, the competition that you have with other water users, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so you, have, you see some numbers here on, on financial impact, right? But the question is, I mean, this financial impact is sort of calculated by others, right? That is not really a disclosure necessarily by the company as in, you know, we have this much less that we could be producing. It's sort of more an analysis by the financial markets of, for example, mining companies or power companies or biotech and other companies on how water is impacting for us different operations. The question is, would it be rewarded? Would the company be rewarded if it makes an investment in water risk as part of ESG and as part of TCFD, right? Is, is, is it rewarded when it makes that, that investment? And so one of the things that we've been looking at is something called a water beta. Because again, when I talk about the capital markets, I mean, initially we're gonna be talking about it from the perspective of, of the investment community that looks at these companies and then engages with these companies and say, hey, you got a problem in this locality, that locality, with that particular plant and whatnot. And so we formulated something called water beta. This is done with a, a lot of partners, including MSCI, 
uh, including uh, Morgan Stanley, including uh, more recently NASDAQ and other types of, of, of uh, organizations. We will look at how much volatility in share price and how much premium in share price could be realized by a corporation if it manages the volatility that is caused by water, i.e. indirectly through climate change, um, climate change impacts and beyond. So water beta is something that we kind of map as a, as a risk here, right, relative to financial beta. And by the way, beta, what, when you say beta in the financial markets, it automatically means volatility. It automatically means risk. So financial beta is really about the, syst the systematic risk. So risk that every company is exposed to relative to the global market. And water beta is a specific company's risk relative uh, related to water relative to its index. Right, and now we can start seeing that different kinds of companies, right? So basically above one means you're more, more uh, volatile than the market below one, you're less volatile than the market. And then here you have a range too. So now here it depends on what industry you belong to, whether you're, you have high water risk, or you got low water risk and it impacts your performance on the capital markets. So healthcare, you know, has a different impact, uh, impacts uh, impacted by a lot of water risk, oil and gas, uh, food and beverage more so than, syst than, than systematic risk. Financials impacted more by systematic risk. You're looking at companies like mining companies and energy companies, a lot of global market risk and, and, um, and, and, and water risk, right? So, so it becomes kind of a, a way to triage your companies in the capital markets. And here's something I forgot to say because most in the audience probably come from or think about, uh, you know, we need better policy to regulate and govern our cor corporations. And I don't disagree with that. However, the, 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 the tack that we have taken sort of following TCFD is, no, 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 let's look at where the market signal is. Is there a market signal that would prompt a company to become more sustainable as opposed to a policy signal that forces a company to become more sustainable. It's kind of like, you know, the stick and the carrot that we're trying to bring together. So if you look historically at, at, at the performance of companies in these different spaces, if we look at an, at an index, so we benchmark, for example, uh, the, uh, um, this is, a, uh, this is an, an index of companies where we incorporate water risk in how you allocate companies in a bucket of companies that, 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 that banks invest in or pension funds invest in. So basically companies with high water risk, we allocate less of and companies with low water risk, we allocate more of. And of course this changes every quarter, this changes every year. And what we see is we have a, a constant outperformance when we take into account water risk relative to the benchmark. And it started breaking out around, I mean, the data is not on here because it's kind of a cartoonish version of the real data around about 2013 or so. 2013 is when we started seeing a separation of water really becoming an additional risk factor that the market started looking at relative to uh, the benchmark. And the benchmark in this case is an, uh, is an index that is not adjusted for water risk. So water risk actually commands a risk premium, right? Over and above all the other risks that, corp that com uh, companies are exposed to. And so the water beta, that volatility risk is essentially kind of that difference between the benchmark and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the water risk adjusted, uh, water risk, the new water risk adjusted benchmark. So the question you're asking probably is now, why is this line higher than that line? because this is performance, right? This is return. So why is a high water risk index better performing? Aha, because we discounted the companies that had high water risk and we essentially uh, uh, put a premium on the companies that have a low water risk and that's why you get an outperformance. I mean, in fact, we can start seeing that depending on a company and I'm just gonna disclose one here because we started to work a lot with the Japanese. So Japan and Europe, Jap uh, the Japanese market and the European market are very bought into disclosing their risks to the TCFD. American companies are not that much bought into that yet. I mean, it's coming, 
but they're not quite there yet. So it's mainly the J Japanese and the, and the European markets. And it, so when you look at it, this is Asahi. Some of you might know Asahi from Asahi beer, <laughs> right? So, so they command a, an additional premium, share price premium of about 3% over the benchmark by managing their water risk, right? So you can start seeing financial materiality so far, not just in borrowing money from the market, but also a share price premium that you can command in the market. And so a lot of that, so ESG is nice, but ESG and, 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 and TCFD related to financial metrics really drive uh, market forces. But right, let's move forward. Um, so let's look at, uh, actually, let me move forward to, to, to green bonds. So let's look at, actually, this, this title here carried over. I apologize for that. So what about the fixed income market? So let's move from the, the stock market to the fixed income market, because many corporations, they issue bonds, right? Sometimes they just issue plain vanilla bonds, and sometimes they issue um, uh, uh, green bonds, right? Where we have seen a lot more green bonds, including from Microsoft and Amazon and other companies. The big question is, is there a benefit in doing that aside from having a green bond? I mean, does it ever carry a market premium? All I'm showing here is, so what this should say is, what is the impact on the uh, on the uh, the fixed income market? So green, uh, let's first look at, at the green bonds. So green bonds are issued both by government, governments and by corporations. And right now we're just gonna worry about the corporations. When we look at the corporations, what is a lot of that invested in? Now you can look at, well, sort of the percentages of where the green bonds are actually invested in. And this looks great. I mean, we have investment of green bonds in transportation in buildings, uh, buildings and energy and in, in, in water, uh, transportation, all of that. So, I mean, this is fantastic. The problem is the green bond market is still only a couple of percent of the total bond market. So part of the problem uh, that we do not have more green bonds than we should have, I mean, it's, it's 400 billion, right? About 400 billion, but there is close to, you know, 80 trillion in, in, uh, in, in, in bonds overall, right? So it's still a very small percent. So one of the challenges is that perception of higher cost for issuers. So this is an interesting thing too on materiality. So if one can demonstrate that a green bond not only looks great for a company to issue because you're investing in green technology and in everything else that's sustainability, if there is actually a market signal that tells you that, you know what, it's not only good for you from a, you know, from a marketing perspective, it's also good for you from a from an issuance perspective, from a cost perspective. Now we're looking again at financial materiality. And we're starting to see some of that. These are early data, and this is just data over, over almost about a year. These are not ours. So the materiality in the green bond yield. So one of the ways of looking at green bond performance and, and, and cost is by looking at the yield or the yield spread. Um, so basically the more volatile the more volatile a bond or riskier, the more risky a bond, the higher the yield would be, right? And what we're starting to see is over time that the spread of uh, conventional bond yields over, uh, over green bond yields is starting to, starting to uh, decrease. So the basis points are starting to decrease. So, so what happens is that, that essentially over time, we're starting to see that green bonds are becoming cheaper than vanilla bonds, than non-green bonds, even though the underlying risk is the same. I mean, if I'm a corporation and I want to issue a green bond versus a regular bond, the risk of the bond is essentially, or the, the price of the bond, uh, the, the credit rating I'm getting for the bond is going to be the same because the credit rating is based on the credit of the credit rating of the company. So if I'm Apple, and I issue a regular bond, I issue a green bond. It's all based, uh, the interest rate that you pay is all based on the, on the risk of, of the company itself. So it doesn't really matter if it's green or not. Where it does become important is what the demand is for these bonds, right? So the demand for the bonds um, is going to sort of drive kind of that, that risk premium and hopefully drive the risk premium lower. So what we want to see is that the yield goes down, that we get a lot more demand for green bonds and that basically investors perceive green bonds to be less risky than other bonds. 
So here, here we see the difference. So this corporate ESG score matters. So now we look at green bonds where we layer on top of that, whether or not the company is a high ESG scoring company or a low ESG scoring company. So when you're a low ESG, let's first do the high ESG scoring company. When you're a high ESG scoring company, what we see over here is that the yield um, of the, uh, right, we see a, a um, oops, a lower yield of, of the uh, of a green bond for high uh, ESG scoring companies than what we see for low ESG scoring companies. So basically, if you're a company that does not disclose any of its ESG risk and you're issuing a bond, you're not going to have as much demand for your bond. Whereas if you're a company that is a high scorer of ESG risks and you issue a green bond, there's going to be much more demand for your bond. When there's much more demand for the bond, what's going to happen is that the yield of the bond, the, the yield is, is inverse to the demand, right? So when there's a lot of demand for a bond, the yield will go down and actually the bond becomes cheaper over time and less risky over time, which is a great market signal because it tells you, look, disclose your ESG risks, issue green bonds, and over time, your bond will become uh, more attractive to in the uh, Will become attractive to investors. There's a lot of demand from investors, and becomes cheaper to the to the payer. So we wanted to go beyond that, and say, you know what? The green bonds are only two percent of the total bond market. There is a boatload more bonds out there, right? That are vanilla bonds, and so this is work that one of my students is doing. Uh, one of my students, Dan Lee, is doing, and she's looking at at um, the the uh, plain vanilla bonds. So main, mainstreaming green bonds. So we're going to go to the vanilla bonds. So we went beyond green bonds, only the ones that are uh, triple B rated or higher, right? Um, and we wanted to see if you just issue any kind of bond and you, uh, you, just, you disclose your ESG risk or you do not disclose your ESG risk. So we actually set the bar lower than before. Remember, before we had a green bond and we had high and low ESG rating. So now we have a non-green non bond, a plain vanilla bond, and we're looking at, do you disclose your ESG risks or do you not disclose your ESG risks? And what we're starting to see, so we looked at all bonds that were issued over the past 15, 20 years across all these different sectors of the economy. And one of the things that we started to see is a, is a change again in how the bonds are being perceived just by companies that are disclosing their ESG risk. So basically telling the market that you understand what your environmental, social, and government risks are actually gives you a 10 basis point decrease on the spread or on the risk of your bond, which is great, right? Because it's, again, a market signal where you disclose your ESG risk, the market responds. You have a lot of buyers and investors that want your bond because of a lot of high demand for that bond. The yield spread goes down, the risk goes down, right? And so therefore the cost of that bond goes down. So, and there is a bit of a difference at the time of issue. At the time of issue, we have plus numbers and after that we have negative numbers. Why is that? Well, it's kind of like, you know, issuing all your risks to the tax man, right? The, the more you disclose, the, the riskier you appear, right? So we initially, at the time of issue of the, the bond, you know, the bond is viewed to be more risky, but then after you start trading, when people understand, I guess, uh, and, and the liquidity of that bond over time, people start understanding how a corporation is managing its risk, the, the risk or the yield uh, goes down. So basically what it says is ESG disclosure results in a lower risk bond after trading. So again, we have a positive signal. We have a positive signal from ESG disclosure on, 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 uh, on uh, your performance in the, in, in, in the uh, your share price performance in the market, on the, the borrowing costs for debt, on the bonds that you're issuing. So, so far, it's all positive. That's part of your materiality. So now I want to just go to something that goes beyond the corporates and the corporate, the, 
the, the, the, the municipal, the public sector doesn't fit within TCFD. I just have a one, two more slides here. So these are the municipal bonds. So these are a whole different set, right? So for those not familiar with the municipal bonds, this is sort of our universe in which municipal bonds have invested in over time, right? Municipal bonds are, are a very significant fraction of the total bond market. And that's sort of a lot of the work that we're doing with Nuveen, which is that uh, TIA investor and third largest holder of muni bonds. So basically they said, you know, why should companies even disclose it? Why should governments or cities, uh, counties, municipalities disclose their ESG risk. We're just going to rate externally. We live in the, in the era of big data. We're going to gather all data we can find about a city, about a county, about a state, and all the bonds that they issue to all this stuff, we're just going to rate it. We're going to rate it using ESG models. And now we want to find out, I guess, whether, you know, the underlying... Um, uh, should I say the underlying ESG metrics, intentional or not, of any municipality actually start making a difference in in uh, in the bond market. So we are rating all these models. We've been looking at models across water and hospitals and electric and city and schools and higher education. And now we're looking at I mean transportation and everything else. And we're, we we look at so the different ways and how we could start looking at all these municipal bonds. And as I said, they're third largest holder of muni bonds. The current market of muni bonds is about $3.8 trillion outstanding, right? So we essentially screen all these 40,000 issues for this particular, this particular owner, right? And look at sort of how different bonds spread out. Now, what, what Nuveen will do with that, once they have that information, they will bundle the top quintile and the bottom quintile and they sell it to you and me, for those of you that are TAIA, right? So you can actually go into your pension fund and select, you know, your bond fund and you will get a different kind of performance. But now think about it at some of the underlying metrics that are part of your sustainable bond fund may actually have been generated by the University of Michigan, which is, I think, pretty, pretty cool. So we're not there yet. We don't know yet, I guess, how a high ESG, a low ESG rated bond municipal bond fund is going to perform. We don't yet know what the market signal is going to be. However, there is some hope. And the hope is this. Municipalities, as I mentioned earlier, also issue green bonds, a fraction, right? Just like corporates issue green bonds, but it's only 2% of the $80 trillion in in the bond market, the corporate bond market, municipalities also issue green, green bonds, but it's a very small fraction of the total municipal bond market. So when you look at the green municipal bond market, since about 2016, and this is not our work, this is work that was just published last year, we're starting to see a premium there as well of eight basis points. So if there's anything that municipalities want more than anything else, and particularly post COVID is let's source our capital for our infrastructure, for all the stuff we want to build as cheaply as possible. Right. And so the, the less you have to pay for your bond, the better, right. Over time. And so what we're starting to see is that the yield spread, and this is secondary. That's once, once green municipal bonds start trading, that we're starting to see a spread between between a vanilla bond and a and a green bond, uh, a green municipal bond. So the green municipal bond becomes a more trusted, more in demand, less risky bond over time, just like the corporate bonds, corporate green bonds or corporate bonds that are disclosed by, that are issued by ESG disclosing corporates also become more um, attractive. So just a couple of take home messages here because there's sort of a lot of data I went through, but the, 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 the basic point was, does disclosing your risk or does even managing your risk or does understanding your ESG and climate risk actually matter in the capital markets? Are the markets starting to respond? Is there a market signal as well as the, 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 the typical policy signals or the policy signals that most of us, that many of us look at? Is there a capital market signal? And there is. So the sustainability scrutiny, as I argued, is going to be a necessary condition for disclosure and materiality pricing, right? And, and materiality pricing 
ultimately will really help scaling all this sustainability work that is, I mean, to be honest, still fairly fringe. It's sort of, it's not, it's a fraction of the market. Is this, if we can make sustainability material and we have a material signal, can we, can sustainability become a mainstream financial signal that essentially will drive the way how we invest in infrastructure, in corporate infrastructure or in municipal infrastructure? So ESG disclosures are becoming increasingly material in terms of cost of capital, uh, so both debt and equity, in terms of bond yield spread, um, T TCDF disclosures, which are very closely related to ESG factors and metrics, they have to be financially material, right? Because otherwise the market won't respond. I mean, that was the premise of TC TCFD. I don't know why I will see TCDF. I must be dyslexic. <laughs> so it is TCFD. Um, uh, scalability will be improved when actual price signals emerge and become stable or can be benchmarked across sectors and geographies, right? And that's something that everybody has been looking at. There's actually even still papers out there that right now say we're all hoodwinked by ESG because ESG right now is a lot driven by metrics in the physical world that are not well translated in the financial world. And if you can't translate in the financial world, it's very hard to know how to respond to them. Uh, corporate engagement in disclosing ESG risk under TCFD guidance is likely to be um, become more facilitated when these financially material risks can be measured and verified. And this is actually something that we are doing with uh, the Japanese, a Japanese company that is working with pr practically all holdings of the Nikkei 225 is to actually start giving them a financially material metric to disclose their water risk for their TCFD disclosures such that their share price can sort of improve or capture a premium. Um, this is the last thing I wanted to say. It's a lot of information. Uh, and, and as I said, it's really sort of taking the, the, the capital markets angle instead of the policy angle to sort of figure out where we meet in the middle. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Before we, um, let's go ahead and just jump into questions. And so we'll go Caitlin and then Daniel. Caitlin, do you want to unmute yourself and then just ask? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us, Professor Adrians. Absolutely. My okay. question is in regards to the different elements of ESG investing. Right. Is there an inclination for the more, um, I guess, tangible elements of ESG ratings to be moving towards carbon measurements? Mm -hmm. I feel like that is probably the most quantitative measurement, but I guess going along with that, how will more qualitative factors such as social implications be brought into these ratings? Or do you think that they need to be ratings in and of themselves separately? Um, that's a very good question. So it's sort of, I mean, your question in part is an aggregate metric, right? The whole question of aggregate versus, versus sort of more specific metric, all the indicators in the market right now are that people are probably gonna be moving away as far as this materiality is concerned from ESG. The value is gonna be in the pillars and the factors. So ESG becomes part of factor investing, but an aggregate ESG value in the financial markets is probably slowly going to sort of become more granular to figure out what can you actually measure having an impact on future growth and what are more intangible factors that are going to be um, part of part of uh, uh, sentiment sentiment factors right so the sort of sentiment factors uh, and, and and the the, the real operational kind of risk factors and I think that's that's the direction things are going I mean, in fact if, when I talk to to MSCI and and to many of the other providers in the industry I just recently had a call with Refinitiv and and with NASDAQ, they now get calls from specific pension funds from wherever they are, is to actually develop a very specific index specifically on one metric out of the entire ESG universe to try to figure out, I guess, how to improve just on that. So I hope that that answers your question, if not directly in a roundabout way. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. Really yep. interesting. Um, Daniel and then Allegra. Uh, hi, uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Professor, for your uh, presentation. Hey, Daniel. Uh, 
I guess the, the question that came to mind as we were presenting um, is how much do the ESG ratings correlate with, um, with a, a firm performance, right? Historical performance, right? To sort of try and uh, tease out of the causality versus correlation, right? Because maybe investors just look at uh, other metrics that also correlate with ESG. There's a paper that just came out out of the financial literature and the title is aptly, uh, um, uh, uh, there's an, the app title is aggregate confusion. <laughs> in that it does not well. So there's sort of two things. One, ESG ratings are a very poor characteristic of ESG risk because there's so many different ways and poor benchmarks on which they are being measured. There is some degree of agreement in some sectors and there is a lot of disagreement in other sectors. So, and, and a lot of it has to do with, I mean, this actually, your question reminds me of um, when I started going with this whole water bait on Aquarius to the capital markets and I went to many for about a year or so in between London and Frankfurt and Singapore and, and New York and whatnot. And a couple of times I made it onto the trading floor and I started talking to some of the folks that were uh, you know, actually doing the, the real-time analysis. And, and I said, okay, how do you incorporate water risk? I said, I said, we don't. How do you incorporate ESG risk? I said, well, we don't really. There's so much else to keep track of. Um, so then the question was, but how would you incorporate it? So, well, I mean, if you have something within what you're measuring that is sort of uh, a, 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 a regular risk for a certain type of company or for a certain type of sector, we can actually incorporate it and know what to do with it, I guess, in our in our risk assessment. And I said, wait a minute. I mean, so if you have two companies that are exactly the same, say two mining companies, two semiconductor companies, whatever it is, and one is a higher water risk user, or a high carbon emitter, and the other one is a low water risk user and a low carbon emitter, the low one is a better one, right? And he said, well, to you it is, but these, these numbers in terms of carbon and the numbers in terms of water, as in tons of carbon or square or, or, or cubic kilometers of water, are no financial risk metrics. I have no idea what these companies, even the high water risk and the high carbon risk company, is actually doing to mitigate its risk, such that it affects its price performance, its credit risk, its everything else, right? So it's the, 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 the devil is in the translation between the ESG risk and the financial risk. And that's why I said, look, we need to have more research that goes on in, that starts looking from the capital through the capital markets lens, right, to tease things out. Now, that said, there are many different groups, including at Harvard and elsewhere, that are, are building all sorts of statistical models, as well as machine learning models to try to tease out which factors make sense. There was a recent study was done by Deutsche Bank, and I know it's not the best example because it is in the news for various bad reasons, <laughs> but uh, they did one on ESG and sort of corporate performance. And the only factor that statistically stood out was retention programs of companies. And it was not in 2020, by the way, this was before COVID. Retention programs and pension programs of companies. Those were the two ESG factors out of everything else that really explained the difference, I guess, of high ESG or low ESG. So, so there is, you know, it's a very tough place to be in. And so that's why we start looking for these market signals. And that's also to, back to the earlier question that was asked, uh, why aggregate ESG is going to be a, a, continue to be a very tough sell and people are going to start going more towards discrete um, and more granular factors within ESG and looking at either sentiment side of things or operational side. Thank you very much. Yep. All right, Allegra, and then I have one more question to ask and we'll wrap up. Go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, Professor, for this um, non-boring yeah, talk about green bonds. I, I've been to a lot of talks about green bonds and this one was not boring. And so congratulations. <laughs> um, that was great. Um, my question is about um, disclosure and reporting standards, um, you know, uh, and mm -hmm. different stock markets, what, what you see as the value or leverage um, of having different stock markets create their own mandatory 
reporting frameworks. I'm thinking here of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange with their mandatory integrated reporting from this is now almost a decade ago to something like the NASDAQ that doesn't have any of these. So do you think requiring ESG, very granular ESG reporting at the level of stock markets uh, makes sense as a point of leverage or is it really at the national, you know, like the SEC and, you know, the Hong Kong reporting commission level that would make the most uh, difference in your mind. Thanks. That is, an, well, first, uh, first off, thanks for uh, your comment regarding the green bonds. Uh, I think this whole yield spread is a very, a very cool thing <laughs> and, and relating it to ESG disclosure. Your other question is, is, is very dear to my heart, heart because it does, it did become a very recent problem even in our own analysis that yes, it will to a large degree become also stock market specific. So not only is there not a benchmark on ESG, there's also not a benchmark on what different markets actually require, right? I mean, I used to spend a lot of time in Finland. The Finns do it again, very different. The Nordics in general, right? They do it again, very different. And so Johannesburg and whatnot. So we, we just mainly looked at because of our recent work um, between the US uh, and for example, look at NASDAQ versus, or S&P versus um, uh, say, uh, say the Nikkei 225. And basically there is almost no comparison. You cannot say, look at all, these are all the equities and this is how we're gonna be treating them. And this is a disclosure, no matter where they are traded or what, whatever the primary trading, uh, tra trading market is, it will not work. And we know by now that that will not work because of the different requirements I guess that already are ex in existence in these different uh, platforms. And so therefore things that you're calling out as an opportunity, for example, for the SMP already were incorporated as a disclosure or as a risk that's already taken into account, for example, in the Nikkei market, right? There's already taken into account in Johannesburg. And so those are gonna be very interesting things to tease out. We're actually now starting to look at these correlations between stock markets which, sorry, Daniel, but that makes even the ESG more confusing because now, now you have to start worrying about where you're trading. <laughs> oh, and with that, we're at time. And so I am sorry, the last question just doesn't get asked. Oh, pa so painful, so painful. Um, oh, can't hear you. Whoops, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I have a fast mute because I have a little kid. Um, so thanks for joining us today. If you missed any of our previous talks, then you can view those on our website. And if you didn't get a chance to ask um, Professor Adrian's a question, I'm putting his email address right now in the chat and you are welcome to email him directly. Absolutely, and happy to, uh, happy to respond and engage. Um, can we all just have a, a, a moment to uh, verb to acknowledge Professor Adrian's. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs> Hopefully next time live. Yes, uh, we can all hope so. Um, please come back next month where our topic will again center on fintech and financial inclusion with Professor Terry Friedline from the School of Social Work. Thanks everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Christy.